Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath. I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ and a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition. I want to say thank you to our co-sponsors for today's webinar, the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions in Jerusalem, the UK, and the US. We're delighted today to dig deeper into the One Democratic State campaign with our two guests, Dr. Leila Farsak, Chair of the Department of Political Science at University of Massachusetts, Boston. Leila has written extensively on issues related to the Palestinian economy. Her latest book, which she has co-edited, is, co is The Arab and Jewish Questions, Geographies of Engagement in Palestine and Beyond. And Jeff Halper, founder of Israel Committee Against House Demolitions, his two books, War Against the People, Israel, the Palestinians, and Global Pacification, and his latest, Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Settler Colonialism, and the Case for One Democratic State have been received with great acclaim. So Leila and Jeff, welcome. We all, we all know, uh, yes, uh, I see some applause. Yes, welcome to you all. We, we all know that the intentional long range policies of Israel have made a two state solution untenable. That it's really been moribund for a long time now if it ever really was even a possibility given Zionism's goals. We're hearing about the various alternatives to two states, one state confederation and various iterations of each one. I'd like to start by asking each one of you to give a short, no longer than five minute opening statement why at this moment, the one democratic state you're proposing is the best alternative. Jeff? <clears throat> Well, thanks, uh, Michael, for organizing this in the Middle East uh, Center, in the, in the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. And thanks, Leila, for agreeing to join me. And thank you all for joining. You know, I'm a part of the uh, One Democratic State Campaign, which is a Palestinian-led initiative to begin to, to replace the one apartheid state that already exists between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River with a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. Um, <clears throat> but it's not only a, another kind of a, a solution to throw into the mix, but there's a very strong political logic behind this idea. And it comes out from kind of a new analysis it's that Zionism is, that we're not in a conflict. A conflict is a certain kind of situation where you, two sides or more, uh, disagree about something or fight about something. And then the way you resolve a conflict is they come together, they negotiate, they find compromises, and then you get to some kind of a, of a resolution. But Zionism is a form of settler colonialism. Uh, settler colonialism is an idea that is not new in the academic world. There's a journal of settler colonialism. There's been hundreds of articles about settler colonialism. Leila has written about settler colonialism like many other people. But that concept of settler colonialism has not really penetrated into the wider public discourse about Palestine. And I can understand why, you know, if you take terms like conflict, or occupation or apartheid, they're easy for people to understand. They're, they're common terms. A term like settler colonialism, what, what, I mean, colonialism, you know, the British and India, okay, I get that. But settler, even though the United States is a settler colonial country, it's not a term we use, we're used to using. It's an academic term. It doesn't flow easily. And what it leads to is a kind of of resolution, which is decolonization. The only way you resolve a colonial situation is through decolonization. Well, what is that? I mean, that's also a term that's completely foreign and very complex for people to get their minds around. 
so that I think part of our job, maybe the first part of our job, is to try to find that language uh, to help people understand what kind of a conflict, if you want to use that term, we're in. Because what your analysis is determines the logic of what's going on and, and the conclusion you come to. So that if you see this as a conflict, then you adopt the conflict resolution model. And that's what we've had for the last 70 years. And the reason it hasn't worked is you're trying to, you know, you're trying to use a screwdriver to hammer in a nail. You have, you have a problem, you gotta get the nail in the, in the wall, but you're using the wrong tool. I think the fact that we've taken the idea of settler colonialism and tried to lay out what that means, um, you know, means that then we have to decolonize. And what we're trying to do in our movement, the ODSC uh, campaign, is to really lay out what does decolonization mean? And we have a 10 point plan that I think, Michael, you're going to, you're going to talk about a little bit. Um, but basically then, that's really why I think our campaign is, is, is not only uh, presenting a new kind of way out, but that has a very strong political logic behind it. You know, the two state solution that everybody has been talking about, not only is dead, but it never was. And again, settler colonialism explains why it never was. Because settler colonialism is a unilateral thing. It's not two sides, it's unilateral. It's when a, a population comes to a country with the intent of taking it over. So Zionism didn't intend to take over 78% of Palestine and leave 22% for the Palestinians. The Palestinians in Jesus' population weren't even a consideration. They weren't a side. Zionism never recognized the Palestinians. To this day, Israel does not recognize the, the, not only the existence, but the national rights of the Palestinian people. And it certainly doesn't recognize their claim over the country or over territory. So the entire thrust of a settler colonial movement is to take over a country. The term Zionism used, the term that Israel uses is Judaization. We're Judaizing Palestine. We're transforming an Arab country into a Jewish country. And all of it, not 78% or 90%, the whole thing. So that, so that if you understand that, then you begin to understand not only why negotiations never succeeded, because it was never good faith. Because a colonial movement is not going to really negotiate with the indigenous population in good faith to give up land that it covets, that it has the power to take. Why would it do that? And so that the two-state solution never was. And we see it today very clearly with settlements and talk of annexation, an actual annexation of East Jerusalem and so on. So the two-state solution, uh, we have to just forget. It never was. There never was a two-state solution. So we'll get um, in. So Jeff, we'll right, get one in. more One more Thank sentence. And that is the other, much. you know, a variation of the two-state is the idea of confederation. And, uh, you know, you know, like Sam Bahur writes about and other people, you know, I'm not really opposed to confederation. As a matter of fact, as a member of the, of the Israeli peace movement, I supported the two-state solution for many years. It wasn't that we didn't accept that idea, especially if Arafat did, or the idea of confederation. The point is that we understand today that Zionism, the state of Israel, impelled by a settler colonial ideology and, and structure, will not allow any kind of whether it's a state or a federal peace of Palestinians to have any kind of equality, any kind of control over its own destiny or over certainly over territory. And so the only solution that remains, so it doesn't only make sense politically, but it makes sense in terms of the, of the way that the, the struggle has been, has been defined by Israel and by Zionism really. The only way out is decolonization. And the only form of decolonization that can work is uh, the creation of a single state, inclusive of everyone, with equal rights for everyone, and of course, the return of refugees. 
Thank you, Jeff. We'll get we'll dig deep into those some of those points that you raised. Layla, please. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thank you very much, Jeff, for your words. Um, I totally agree with you and I actually thank you very much for emphasizing the issue of colonialism and decolonization because uh, I think, you know, we Palestinians have always said that Zionism is a colonial project. I think the trajectory over the past 70 years has been for us to also see that it is also a national project. But fundamentally, it's a national project that is colonial in its essence and its, in its means. But it is true that with the Oslo peace process, there has been an attempt to forget all this colonial and settler colonialism and pretend that we can have a two-state solution. But as Jeff rightly pointed out, uh, the two-state solution was never meant to be a two-state solution. Israel was never interested in a two-state solution. Israel with the Oslo peace process was interested in finding a way by which Palestinians can govern themselves under Israeli sovereignty, or at least under Israeli supervision. And if we look at what has happened in 20 years of peace process, that's exactly nearly 30 years of peace process. That's exactly where we are today. Today, we are in a reality in which Israel is sovereign from the river to the sea. Uh, Israel is the only sovereign entity that has uh, three different, or uh, actually four different legal regimes under its control. One legal regime in which, uh, for the Jews, in which Jews are equal citizens uh, having rights and privileges. One for Palestinian citizens of Israel, in which they are Israeli citizens and have political rights and economic rights, but are treated as second class citizens. And this was particularly confirmed with Israel's nationality law in 2008 that affirmed the right of self-determination only to the Jewish people. And then Israel has another legal system for the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem. These are residents that have, do not have voting rights or citizenship rights, but have a little bit more mobility than the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. And then we have another legal rights, legal framework for the Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, guided uh, still under the Oslo Agreement, but is a, is, is, is a bit of a Fourth Geneva Convention, uh, Israeli laws and Palestinian laws, but one which maintains Israel's sovereignty or control over the settlements which and area C, which still, still constitute 56% of the West Bank. And then we have another legal regime for Gaza in which Israel has Gaza as retreated from Gaza physically, but is still in control of the borders of Gaza, the sea, access to sea and the air, the biggest prison in, in the world today, uh, in which Palestinians in Gaza are uh, under prison uh, and uh, under siege. So this, this reality that we live in a reality uh, on which Israel is the only sovereign, Israel has instituted an apartheid system based on eliminating the Palestinian question by fragmenting it, eliminating Palestinian existence because every colonial project is based on elimination. In the case of Israel and Palestine, Israel tried to eliminate the Palestinian political existence by fragmenting them into various entities. So this makes the case, how do we go from a colonial reality to a decolonial reality? How do we decolonize, as Jeff nicely put it? And I think decolonization can only happen through a one democratic state because such a state guarantees equal rights for all. It does not distinguish between race or nationality or language. The one state uh, solution is the only option that will translate the, the reality of apartheid in, into a reality of equality, one that would foster economic development rather than rely on the exploitation of uh, um, Arabs by Israel. It's also one that demographically is only viable because today in this land that, ha, uh, that Israel is sovereign and in which it controls the Palestinian population, we have a total population of 6.8 million Jews and 6.8 million Palestinians. The fact that 50% of the population under Israel's control is Palestinian and growing faster than the Israeli poses a major question, both for Israel's identity as a Jewish state, but above all, emphasizing the reality of inequality that we have and inequality which is racial, economic, and political, and which will not be sustainable. And last but not least, I think the biggest argument for the one state solution, uh, democratic state, is the fact is that it is the most viable and realistically possible 
and morally uh, superior to any other solution. It's the only one that will reverse the reality of apartheid into a reality of equality. This doesn't mean that it is easy, but it does mean that it is the only option if you wanna allow Jews and Palestinian refugees and immigrants to live in Palestine, Israel equally. I'll stop on that and I'll, I'll take it from here. Thank you. Thank you both for your uh, opening comments. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I wanna get into the nitty gritty of the 10 point plan, but, but the one question I keep hearing over and over again when people hear one democratic state is what, and Jeff, I'm gonna ask you to address uh, Israel and Layla, I'm gonna ask you to address the Palestinians, but why would Israel, the dominant power in this relationship, why would they wanna buy into one state? And Layla, there's disagreement among Palestinians. One state means a radical rethinking of national identity. I mean, people, I, I, Palestinian friends of mine, are, some of them are still holding on to a possibility of two state because of national aspirations. So why would, why would Palestinians agree to one state? So, uh, I mean, that's the question I hear again and again and again. So each one of you, would you take a, take a crack at that? All right, well, that's a, that's a good question because it's true of his issues on, on, on both uh, sides. In terms of, uh, of Israeli Jews, um, they're, they're not gonna buy into this. I mean, I, I don't wanna you know, uh, present any kind of, a, of an illusion that somehow we're gonna convince Israeli Jews that apartheid is bad and Absolutely. we should decolonize. That's not gonna happen. Right. Um, and very much, it's very much in my view, <clears throat> similar to South Africa. You know, because in South Africa, you had the same situation. And that is, um, you had a dominant population, the white European population in South Africa, that ran the country that was not going to cooperate with the ANC in terms of dismantling apartheid. You had a government that was an apartheid government that was not going to cooperate. You had an international community of governments that saw Mandela and the ANC as terrorists. They weren't going to cooperate either. So the, the, the ANC or the, the black population, the anti-apartheid population in South Africa, that was very small, especially you know, towards the beginning, um, had only one ally de facto, and that was the international civil society, the people. I mean, all of you, you know, they and the, so, people of a certain age, remember, we were all involved in the anti-apartheid struggle. And we succeeded, you know, uh, you know, all of us together uh, in, in terms of making apartheid unsustainable, partly by changing our government's policies abroad. Um, so that that I think is very similar to what the Palestinians have to do. They have to understand and they do understand that the Israeli Jews are not going to be active partners. I mean, there's no, we're not going to run around trying to convince my, I'm not going to convince my neighbors that I love, that there should be one state. That's just a non-starter. It's not going to happen. Now, there will be some Israeli Jews, obviously, like me and there's others uh, critical um, that will be a part of it. And that's important because I think we give credibility. And, and, and I think in terms of, of the program that we're, that we're offering, that we'll talk about in a couple minutes, I think it's very powerful because Israelis were involved uh, with Palestinians in formulating it. So it isn't that the Palestinian, a Palestinian group got together in some kind of a vacuum and put up a plan and didn't care whether Israelis liked it or not, or if it was just or not or whatever, just what they, no. We really had two years of really intense discussions where our job as Israeli Jews was to bring in what we thought was, was, were critical issues that, that the Israeli Jews had to have on the table as well. So I think that was a very important part of the thing, but we understand that the Israeli Jews are not gonna be, are not gonna be uh, partners. And therefore, I think our, our strategy is going to have to be to appeal to all of you, to the international civil society, churches, labor unions, uh, university groups, students, human rights organizations, you know, political groups, uh, in, in order to uh, support the Palestinian claims. And, but, but one more sentence, <laughs> I can, I can tell Michael. that is, you see, what the ANC did though, in its, in its mobilization of the international uh, community, was it always had an end game. 
Yeah. You know, one person, one vote. So everybody knew why we're boycotting South Africa. When the clerk came to talk to Mandela, Mandela could say yes or no to his offers based on the, the, the end game the ANC had in mind. One person, one vote. We don't have that today. That's what we're trying to insert because the two-state solution is gone. That was the plan that the PLO bought into, um, right or wrong, but, but that's gone. Uh, and and the one state idea we're just beginning to articulate now. So there's a in a way a political vacuum, uh, but we're not going to be able to mobilize civil society for the for this cause if we don't present a clear and compelling political plan. You know I've known you for 15 years, Jeff, and from the first time I met you, you've been saying you've been talking about the necessity of a political strategy, an end game, and so. Uh, uh, this one democratic state campaign is the fruition of that of that desire and hope. Yeah, Layla, please. Yeah, um, thank you very much for the question. So the the, the I, I totally agree with Jeff. We've been trying to think of what would be the political strategy for a one state solution. Uh, the one state is not a new idea. It's a very old idea. It's an idea that was Zionist had it, human Zionist, what we call human Zionist people like Martin Buber and Yudha Magnus but it was put aside, it was the idea of a binational state. Then the Palestinian came up with the one, one state idea, which is the democratic state, democratic state in all of Palestine, inclusive of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. This was the platform of the PLO from 1971 until 1988. The reason why the Palestinian gave up the idea of a one state and opted for the idea of a two state solution is because the international consensus, unlike South Africa, was on the solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or the, is a two-state solution. So the Palestinian opted for the state, be, largely because on, on half of Palestine, on part of Palestine, on 22% of Palestine, arguing that the idea of a state is better than no state because a state can give you some rights, can give you a passport, can give you some borders, will give you institutions, will allow some return. The big problem was, as Jeff said, given that Zionism is a colonial project, Israel was not interested in implementing a two-state solution. So I think what happened to the Palestinian national movement is that we tried the two-state solution and Israel made it fail. Israel, as if was saying, Zionism, as if was saying, it cannot even accept Palestinians' capitulation. Israel can, Zionism can only accept Palestinians' absence, elimination. Well, the Palestinians are not going anywhere. So when the, what's happening with the Palestinian national movement right now is trying to figure out can we afford to give up a Palestinian state? Can we exist without having a Palestinian state? And I think what happened is now everybody is aware, okay, everybody recognizes the Palestinians. This was not the case 40 years ago. 40 years ago, the Palestinians were just still a bunch of terrorists. Today, everybody knows who are the Palestinians. They know they have a claim to a, their land. They know they've been kicked out of their land. And they know that they have a right to equality and independence. The question Given that the two-state solution was tried and failed because it was never meant, how do we campaign for a one state? And the Palestinians are divided in two lines. One that argues, precisely as Jeff said, no Israeli will ever accept a, a one-state solution. So why do we want to capitulate to the Israelis? The international system with UN Resolution 181 and 242 is based on the two-state solution. So it's stupid to give up the Palestinian state. If you give up the Palestinian state, so what do we become? So they say there is a legal framework, there is an international consensus that oh, finally says since Bush's 2003 roadmap that a Palestinian state is a right and a necessity. This Palestinian state is recognized by 124 states in the United Nations. So many people say this exists. You wanna throw it? You're gonna throw the baby in the bathtub as you say? They're arguing, you know, you need to work with this recognition rather than eliminate it, okay? And people are figuring out this. How do you work out th this recognition of the fact that the Palestinians have a right to self-determination? This is why I think why Sam Bahur and other came up with the idea of a confederation, because the idea of confederation works with the, what you have on the ground. You have the recognition of a Palestinian state and a, an Israeli state, and you want to make them work together. But this is not gonna work if you don't fundamentally address the economic and political and racial inequality that are foundational to Zionism. So how do you translate? Now, other people are saying, forget all that. We need to go to the drawing board 
and stuck, as Jeff said, the only solution is a one state solution where everybody who lives on the land has a right to the land as equal, where you have to deal with a, a transitional justice issues and past uh, injustices, so the right of return has to be guaranteed. But of course, it still remains difficult because you know the Palestinians have to take a stand on settlements. The Palestinians have to explain what you do with Jews who want to migrate to Palestine in a new state. So actually, it is much easier to talk about a two-state solution or binational state than actually start saying, what are the rights of the Jews in Palestine? What are the rights of migrants? When, you know, how do we get Israelis to recognize the right of returns? Or we don't give a damn about Israel recognizing the right of return because this is about power. So the question, how do you generate an international support that ensures that international law is implemented, which means the right of return, equal rights, uh, one vote, one person, one vote, as Jeff said. This needs a reliance on international law, international reliance on international support, but also work on the ground, which is difficult to do when you are so much imprisoned. This is why I think the Palestinians who are best placed to talk about the one state and taking the lead in talking about state are the Palestinians in the diaspora and the Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. And in my view, it's the Palestinian citizens of Israel can, that can lead the conversation because they are the bridge between the two camps. Thank you, Leila and Jeff. So let's, uh, you both have mentioned now uh, the one, uh, the, the, the right of return. So let, I want to talk about that one. It's, it's absolutely critical in the plan in the one democratic state, uh, the right of return for Palestinian refugees and their descendants, it says in the plan. It's, it's listed near the very top. Uh, in fact, you call it in, in the 10 point plan, right of return, restoration, and reintegration into society. Uh, yet, yet, yet it seems it seems intractable in practical reality. At least that's the popular that's the popular characterization of the right of return. So, uh, Layla, would you start us off this time talking about the right of return and why that's so critically necessary and how you see it playing out in 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 real life? And then Jeff, you pick it up after Layla. The right of return is central to the conflict because it's the essence of the conflict is the refugees. Israel has justified its creation on the fact that it was in gathering the refugees of the Holocaust, okay? But it expelled the original people without Palestinians, creating the biggest refugee problem. And we have UN Resolution 194 that emphasizes the right of every person, every refugee to return to restitution and to compensation. It is, it is foundational to, to the question of equality because Israel's creation was based on the expulsion of the Palestinians, okay? A nation state based on expulsion cannot, I mean, it succeeded in the past, but you, you carry still the ghosts of the injustices. The refugee problem is still alive because there are much more in, you know, legal measures um, that support it. And also because it's foundational to, foundational to the question of the equality and the rights of everybody who came from that land to live in that land. Thank you, Jeff. Well, <clears throat> um, again, there's a logic to our plan and the logic comes out of, and Leila talked, touched on this before, what we're really, what's really revolutionary in this idea is that you're changing the basis of, of, of the country from being based on, on an ethnic, national, religious, you know, basis or differences to one that's based on universal citizenship. You know, so in, in, in Israel, Palestine today, who you are, what your civil rights are, who you can marry, what job you have, where you can live, whether you can even leave the country or not, all depends on who you are in terms of your ethnic or national or religious identity. Um, and that's, of course, the basis of uh, not only the elimination of the indigenous, but also of the, of the apartheid system that we put into place. Um, so you have to just get rid of all that. That part of the, you know, a big part of decolonization is dismantling all these structures of domination and control and separation. Now, Refugees have a right to return. You know, we argue that. 
But in the logic of our plan, in the logic of citizenship, there's a whole other set of rights that they have laid on top of that. And that is that the refugees are our citizens. In other words, the fact that you're driven out of the country during a war, or you, or you flee a country during a war, does not mean you lose your civil rights. You know, you become a refugee, that's true. But, but it doesn't mean you've lost your rights to be, to be in your country. So that the idea of citizenship says, not only do the Palestinian refugees have a right to return, but we want them to return because they're our citizens, they're our people. We want them to come home to our, to our so you see there's that, it, 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 it goes beyond simply an argument or a legal case to the fundamental right of a citizen to live in his or her country. Now, in terms of the practical thing that you, that you mentioned, actually, if you get into it, it's very practical. The, the possibility of their refugees actually returning. Uh, there's a, a well-known Palestinian geographer named Salman Abu Sita, who's done a lot of work on land issues and refugee mm. issues in Palestine. And he's found that 85% of the land taken from the Palestinians in 1948 is still available. It's, it's either agricultural land, it was grabbed by the kibbutzim or the moshevim when the Palestinians left, but they kept the agricultural lands. They destroyed the villages and the towns, but they kept the lands as agricultural lands. Or they're under national parks or they're parts of beaches or whatever. But in other words, the land was not built upon, 85% of it. So it's true as a refugee, you're not going to come back to your own home. Your own home is probably gone, unless you know there's still a few in urban areas. But basically, Israel demolished more than 530 villages and towns and urban areas, so your house is probably gone. But you can come back to the part of the country where you come from. Now, there's another thing. There's a, uh, an organization here called Zohrot, an Israeli organization. And they have a, uh, a really interesting program with young Palestinian architects and planners. And you can look it up on their website. And they're planning out on this land, modern communities. Because again, like you say, Michael, part of the plan isn't only bring back the refugees, but to be sure that they're reintegrated. Don't forget, this is a traumatized population for the most part. A lot of them have lived under violence for generations. They're traumatized. They're underemployed, they're undereducated, many of them. Uh, and so, you know, there has to be, they can't just come back and become an underclass in the society. We have to reintegrate them. So there's all kinds of plans of building modern communities on the lands, you know, that, they, that, they, that they'll come back to so that they're able to come back to functioning places modern accommodations with infrastructure and economy and with other populations. They're not going to be ghettos of, of refugees. So if you actually get into the nitty gritty, which is very exciting. I mean, the whole idea of building a new society is actually, you know, I don't see it as a, as a, a threat to Israel. I see it as a challenge to all of us, including Israelis. Um, uh, you find out that actually it's not only just the, 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 the return of the refugees, but it's very doable. And, uh, and therefore, and, and obviously it's uh, an absolutely, uh, it's an absolute part of our program. You can't have any kind of program of, of, of peace and reconciliation and justice without the refugee issue being addressed squarely. Barbara Harvey, who's with the Jewish Voice for Peace in, in the Detroit area sent a question and I wanna <clears throat> have you address it briefly. She said uh, uh, that, uh, to her mind, uh, even uh, whether there's two states or even a single state with Palestinian Bandustans, she's wondering whether it could even physically survive in the long term, given what's been happening in Gaza, where the infrastructure, health facilities, schools, water purification plants, police stations, and others have been bombed. Um, uh, so it makes it physically impossible for a society to even survive. So. Even if a single, even if the status quo remains, she's wondering whether it could even, 
even if there's a long-term survival possibilities. Do you want to address that very briefly, each one of you? Yeah, I, I want to say just two things. Yeah, I'll address this point, but I also want to add something to the issue that Jeff mentioned about the right of return. Please. Right of return, yeah, right of return is a right, but also don't forget that it, it's foundational because, as he said, it's the way by which you create an equal society and they are citizens of the state. But also remember that the refugees, what they want is the recognition of the right of return. Yeah. You know? Okay, and I think this is very important because you admitting your original sin is very important because we don't know how many will return, but if they all want to return, they still, there's place for them. But it's about yeah. admitting that this is a problem, which is, you know, this is the foundation of this, just like the United States, the foundation of the United States is sinful, is based on the elimination of the natives. Okay, we have the privilege, we can talk about that because there are not so many natives as there are no Palestinians in Israel. Often when I, often when I uh, excuse me, often when I answer this question, Leila, it's not just return, but it's having the right of return. And I think that's what you're... you're exactly. uh, the right of return and recognition of right. the right of return. Yeah. How you exercise the right of return is another thing. But getting Israel, for Israel is major. This is why it, it, it touches its foundation. And for Israel to recognize the right of return is admitting that Zionist existence is based on a sinful creation. So how do you deal with that? That's, the, that's on the Israelis, and that's not, that's not on me. Now, coming to the question of the survival of Gaza Strip or not, and of course, the Gaza Strip is not, is not, is not you know, a place, people predict that in, in 20 years' time, the water is, in 10 years' time, five years' time, the water will be unportable, you cannot read it, read it, you cannot take it, you cannot drink it. So, but human nature has been incredibly resilient and finding way to live in very hard circumstances. So the question is not this, the question is not, What's happening in Gaza is unacceptable and has been going on for the past 12 years. If you would have asked us 15 years ago, would that have been, been possible that you put 2 million people under this siege? We would have said, you, it's out of your mind. So it is unfathomable, it's not acceptable, but it is continuing because of the Israel can, it has immunity. So the only way how to make this the daily life more bearable is to hold Israel accountable, to boycott Israel, to hold it uh, uh, to international law, to equal standards like everybody else, and to uphold, uphold international law. Um, that's what I want to say. But the question then becomes, how do you hold Israel accountable when Israel has so much power? Israel has been the biggest success in vaccinating its population. It vaccinated the Palestinians inside 48. It vaccinated the Palestinians in Jerusalem. It has better vaccination policy than the United States, where Pfizer and Moderna were, <laughs> you know, produced a new vaccine. So Israel has incredible access to uh, uh, military and technological uh, advances, is giving technology to the US and Asia. So a country as powerful as Israel, how on earth are you gonna convince it to give up its power? Nobody gives its power willingly. They have to be challenged. And I think that's the fundamental question. And this means that we have to look at the problem also regionally and internationally. The role of what's gonna to happen to the Middle East. You will no longer be able to solve the problem of Palestine if you don't solve the problem of Syria and Egypt. You will no longer be able to problem, solve the problem of the two-state solution and the apartheid if you don't address the, the, the bond, the new bonds being created between authoritarian regimes and colonial regimes. In other words, between the United Arab Emirates and Israel or Saudi Arabia and Israel. Authoritarianism and colonialism go hand in hand. The democracy and, authority and, 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 and colonialism do not work. So I think, again, emphasizing that we are upholding democratic rights and equality for all is the best way to challenge Israel on its assumption and hold Israel accountable to an assumption and take away the power that Israel has by holding it accountable. Thank you. Let me, uh, um, let, let, let's take a look at one of the other points in the 10 point plan. Um, I think we understand the idea of, of individual rights, but in the 10 point plan, you also include the idea of collective rights. Uh, and I want you to talk a little bit about the, how those two are connected. How, and how does this relate to one of your other points, constructing a shared civil society? So is, is, this, is this an incentive for the adoption of the one democratic state or is it an obstacle or simply 
uh, a reality given the historical and political context. How are these three interrelated? Individual rights, collective rights, and a shared civil society. Look, those are all parts of the process of decolonization. In other words, equal rights um, already changes the relationship between the colonizers and the colonized and creates a, uh, a common political space based on, on, on equality. Um, <clears throat> just to go back for a second to Barbara's question, because it relates into here too, and that is that, um, um, you know, the whole idea of individual rights obviously means a parity, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, I, you know, we have to, we have to see the Palestinians as actually being in a in very strong position, oh. at, at potentially. In other words, you know, the Palestinians have one of the highest literacy rates in the world. They have very, uh, you know, an educated population. If you take all the Palestinians in the world and all the Israeli Jews in the world, <laughs> there are more Palestinians in universities than there are Israeli Jews. So, you know, they have a certain edge in that. Even. <laughs> they've, got a very, they've got a very strong economy, um, not only in agriculture, but in high tech, uh, and uh, in other areas, I mean, Sam is, is a part of that, the, the whole um, cyber economy and so on. Uh, so, the, the, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and the Palestinians have another resource that people don't take into account, and that's the diaspora. They have a very large and very wealthy and very educated diaspora that would also kick in. So I would say, without being Pollyannish about it, it's true that Israel is very strong, but I think that, uh, that you know, Shir Hever, who's a political economist, an Israeli political economist, writes that there's a lot of complementariness between the Palestinian and Israeli economies. They function very well together, if, if given a chance. And so I think within a generation, maybe less, I mean, I really, am optim maybe I'm too optimistic, but I really think that given a level playing field, the Palestinians will not take a long time before they reach a certain parity with the Israeli Jewish population. So that I think we have to take that into account. We're not talking about South Africa, where, where colonialism left the black population completely uneducated, completely without skills, completely without, almost completely without uh, political power or land or anything. The Palestinians really have resources. They're not able to use them today, but they're there that would come out like a, like a jack-in-the-box if the lid was opened and, and, and they were able to achieve parity. That's the individual. Jeff, you're, you're muted right now. Jeff, unmute yourself, please. Collective you part, sorry, the collective part, collective rights is that we understand we're not in Nebraska. You know, that there are national groups. Palestinian Arabs, Israeli Jews, for better or for worse, are national groups. And there are other important groups here. There's different ethnic groups, there's different religious groups uh, in the country. And so our idea also, of course, is we have to recognize, in addition to being a democracy with universal citizenship, that we're also a pluralistic, multicultural country. And we have to respect that as well. So in our plan, uh, uh, you know, we, we say that you have your right to your collective identity. You can keep your identities, you can keep your institutions, you can keep your rituals and your holidays and what, all of that within the framework of a democracy, which is very much like the United States and other, and other countries, just a, simply a, a pluralistic democracy. Uh, but that's important because as you said, Michael, in the very beginning, um, you know, we can't ignore the fact that the Palestinians want their national identity. Um, they're, uh, you know, that's what they've been fighting for all these years. Uh, and, uh, and Israeli Jews as well, they're not gonna give up you know, being Zionists, no matter what the political structures are. So you say, okay, we have to find ways for those things to be expressed, but not at the expense of, um, of, uh, of living together and so on. And that leads me quickly to the third point, And that is this whole idea of a common civil society, a new civil society, a new political economy. Uh, 
And here's where I think this is the, the sort of the one of the end points of decolonization. That is not only have you dismantled the all the colonial structures and created a, a, a new polity and a new society where people can begin to uh, integrate and live together in equality and so on, but you're also um, you're also creating a new national, if you want to put it that way, a state-based identity. You know, like, for example, in Jordan. I mean, Jordan is an absolutely artificial country. It was created with a pencil by the British. But there is today a Jordanian identity in many, in many you know, it has developed over the course of years as people live together and, and, and participate in a common political uh, and economic framework. So I think that's going to happen, too. And a new political community will begin to emerge. And that's why we're not looking at a binational state. Because there's two versions of the one state. Right. One of them is binational. So a lot of people, more people buy into the binational idea, which is obviously easier to sell to Israelis. Because, you know, Israeli, somehow, you know, there's a way of then retaining this Israeli national thing. And, and it's sort of a form of the two-state solution in a way. Problem with the binational solution is again it perpetuates these these borders, these ethnic, national, religious borders. So in our in our idea, we'll have one society, one political community emerging that everybody can can agree on, can participate in, can can be a part of, and then within that, if you want to marry within your religious community or you want to live within your ethnic community, that's fine, you can do that. But, but, but nevertheless, a new nationwide political uh, community has emerged. And, uh, and that really is, I think, together with the acknowledgements that, that Leila was talking about, that really is the end game in terms of decolonization. When not only a new polity, but a new society and a new, a new decolonized national identity there's a new us that begins to emerge. And let me use one quick example that, that I've used before, just in a sentence, just to give a, a, a concrete example of that. You know, it's, football is very important, not Super Bowl, but what, what you know, you call soccer is <laughs> important in the world. Uh, and uh, in the FIFA standings, the international football standings, the Palestinian football team has a higher ranking than the Israeli team. But neither have succeeded in getting into the World Cup. And the World Cup is like the Super Bowl on steroids. <laughs> no? Can you imagine if the combined teams, uh, actually there's a film called Gold Dreams that you might look at, uh, the 2006 World Cup where Palestine got very close to getting in, the Palestinian national team. Uh, but imagine if, if together our team, <laughs> our team, you know, gets into the World Cup, the kind of nation building that would generate. So I think what we have to do is provide that framework and those structures and that parity where all this can happen and then let it happen. And I think personally in the younger generation, I think we're going to get to to a kind of a normalization quicker than we expect. You know, the young generation moves on fairly quickly. And I think uh, that's the optimistic part of our of our plan. You know, Jeff, uh, that reminds me of the uh, South African national rugby team. Leila, let, let me come to you uh, and then you can pick up if you want to respond yeah. to Jeff as well. But let me ask you another question that, and move on to another one of the points. Jeff just referred to, as he does in his book, <clears throat> the... Uh, strong economic advantages of Palestinians. And of course, your life work, Layla, has been about uh, the field of social, political, and economic justice. So Layla, would you talk a little bit about uh, how achieving a sustainable, equitable economy, uh, uh, how economic justice can be realized in this context, in the context of a one democratic state? Thank you very much. This is a very good, a very important question because mm -hmm. economic is at the essence of this. The reason why we don't have a one-state solution is because the economics is not for it. The economics on the ground is the fact that you have an Israel high-tech society that is fully integrated in the world economy that has a GDP 10 times the size of the Palestinian GDP, 
And you have a Palestinian economy which is fragmented, oppressed, dominated by Israel that can, has no access to the outside world or mediated via Israel. And this fundamental economic inequality it can is at the basis for why the one state solution will not work. Many Palestinians will tell you, I don't want to be under Israeli domination. I don't want to be a worker in Israel. I don't want to be under, under the mercy of Israeli capital. I don't want to be under the mercy of Israeli regulations. Okay. So how do you address that? You cannot address that without sanctions. Every proposal that was made for resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, including the partition plan of 181, included the idea that economic cooperation should be the basis of the relationship between any Israeli and Palestinian society. Zionism has been adamant on separation. Now, how can you encourage, how can you dismantle this Israeli economic domination is the same question that you address when you start to, how do you dismantle white supremacist uh, economic domination in the United States? How do you make uh, the black equal to, to, the, to the white in the United States? How do you counter uh, Trump in the United States? These are the same economic question you are dealt with, okay? So this needs sanctions, this needs, you know, fostering a reparation system in which you're gonna help the Palestinian economy stand on its own feet. You need to institute joint venture based on equality, not on domination. These are a whole set of laws that and, and, and ideas that have, have to be implemented. Because while the Palestinians have indefinitely, as Jeff said, are among the most educated, have incredible potential, they have been under economic oppression and domination by Israel. And how do you dismantle that is very central. And here again, we go, as he said, Europe has a role, the Palestinians have a role, the Israelis have a role. Now, I would like to come back to the issue of individual versus collective right and how do we create a new we? And I think it's important that we look at that in historical sense, okay? The 20th century was a century of the nation state. The 21st century, as, as we see with the new generation, they're much more focused on rights as a, than on the nation, okay? Yeah. This, the, everybody now is talking, we can exist, have our collective right manifested in different ways. And I think the best example is the United States. I mean, I've never thought that the United States would be a very good example for Israel and Palestine. Having lived here for 20 years, I realized today, oh my God, yeah, the difference between a southerner and a Massachusetts is even larger than the difference between a Zionist and a Palestinian. <laughs> and they're under the same state. Okay, and it came through blood and through war and still with racism, which is appalling, okay, that we still live in. But they live under the same political structure, a political structure that gave the idea of a collective right by saying that there is state rights, right? And then you have a federal system on top that is the national right. Now, I am not interested whether it is a binational, this is not my issue, but the issue of collective rights, the fact that people want to speak their language, want to run their, country, their local government as they wish, this can always exist and can always be protected. The big challenge is how do you move from that to creating a new we, a new us. And I think this issue of new us, as Jeff said, needs a mechanism of historical reconciliation, needs a, 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 you know, a, a way of talking about past injustices in an open way, and a way of willing to give up privileges in order to be equal. And usually this does not happen without having either a state that wants to uphold equality as Lincoln tried to do in reconstruction and then after, and, and happened in reconstruction and then reconstruction was thrown out of the window after 10 years, 12 years, or what's happening now today in the United States. But in, in the Palestinian case, it has to be either an external bodies or visionary Israelis and Palestinians that in which Israelis are willing to give up their privileges in order to live in a state in which everybody is equal, able to exercise their economic and political equality, and also live their collective identity, their collective identity being protected. Thank you, Layla. Uh, Jeff, you've written, uh, Layla referred to this before about a larger regional uh, uh, approach. And Jeff, you've written extensively about Israel's quote, universalizing, weaponizing, and exporting a model of militarized democracy. So the last two points of the 10 point plan have to do with uh, this new state's global role, first in the region and then in its international responsibility. 
You talk about building coalitions with progressive forces in the Arab world and beyond and building, quote, a new world order based on human dignity and respect for the people's rights to freedom and just distribution of resources and will provide a healthy and sustainable environment. Is this a utopian vision? Is it practical? Do you see it? Do you see it happening anywhere now? Talk to us. And maybe Jeff, you start and then Layla, you jump in too, since you referred to it earlier uh, in the negative, I think. So Jeff, jump on in. Well, I think the uh, part of the idea is that uh, you can't decolonize in a vacuum. In other words, Israel, Palestine is a small piece of land within a much larger region. A region that's also living under a kind of uh, neo-colonialism. Also, it's not settler colonialism, but it's another form of colonialism, neo-colonialism of the left. It's you know autocratic governments, corrupt governments, uh, and uh, and so it's hard to see an enlightened, egalitarian, democratic, pluralistic, economically flourishing new country in, in Palestine, whatever its name will be, that has to emerge with the civil society, existing in a region that's uh, underdeveloped, de-developed, um, unable to develop, corrupt, autocratic, and so on. So certainly part of our, of our job, and that's reflected in our plan, is like you said, to work with progressive forces in the Arab and wider Muslim worlds uh, in order to decolonize, in a sense, uh, uh, the entire region. And uh, it's not easy to do, but again, you know, if you take the Arab Spring in different countries, you know, the Syrian civil war, unfortunately, you know, but a lot of other manifestations, this is what the Arab peoples and the Muslim peoples beyond that, Iran and other places uh, want. I mean, there's been tremendous movements for democracy and equality uh, uh, in the Arab world and in the wider Muslim worlds. Uh, you know, even today in Thailand, you've got uh, in Indonesia, and you've got uh, these kinds of struggles going on all over. Uh, and, you know, there, I think a lot of them are really, uh, you know, li they're, they're living under a suppression and an, occup and an occupation in a way of, uh, of the neo-colonial world of global capitalism uh, that's very similar to the Palestinians. You know, I write in my book, War Against the People, about what I call global Palestine. And that is in many ways, Israel over Palestine is a microcosm of the global North over the global South. Uh, and, uh, and certainly, you know, I think what's, what is happening, not enough, but, we're, but I think people are aware of it, is that the Palestinian issue has become very emblematic for oppressed peoples all over the world. Uh, and uh, I mean, I've, I've had friends that were at Standing Rock when, uh, when the protests were going on that told me there were more Palestinian flags there than there were Israeli flags. Yeah. You know, when you're, when you're trying to express not only my own group's grievances or claims or rights, but, you know, you're trying to, to, uh, to, you know, to link up with other oppressed groups, kind of the lingua franca, the, the symbol that links everybody together is a Palestinian flag. It's become emblematic of the, stru of the struggles of oppressed peoples all over. And that's something that I think we have to work on, both for the sake of the Palestinians, because that's, those are important parts of the international civil society that we need to mobilize, but also because you know, we've learned a lot and we have, you know, and, 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 you know, and our struggle has a lot to contribute to the struggles of other peoples. You know, the United States is a settler colonial country. So certainly uh, not only the, uh, the black Americans, but certainly the native Americans, you know, have a lot in common with the, with, with, with the Palestinians, decolonizing the United States. And then I go further and I, you know, I talk in my book, War Against the People, about a need for a global decolonization, that we're all living. I mean, the, the ultimate intersectionality is that we're all living under the same oppressive neoliberal capitalist system. And uh, so in a sense, all of us are in the same boat. And, uh, 
And we have to decolonize from that kind of, and, and try to find, you know, what is our equivalent of the one state solution globally? How do we replace this capitalist regime globally with, with something else? So I think there's, there's direct ties from the, the Palestinian struggle all the way to the wider global struggles of, 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 of peoples all over the world, and then uh, peoples in our region, and then peoples all over the world, and then the entire struggle for, uh, you know, for a decolonization globally. Thank you, Jeff. Layla? Um, I think Jeff is very ambitious and I really envy him for that, you know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, I would call it a, a, a fight for justice and liberation. Uh, decolonizing, I mean, the world has always been an unjust place, you know, that's... Uh, so I do, I do think that what is maybe universalizing the Palestinian question, that it is a question of a struggle for justice that has been unmet and with which many people can associate with. Uh, now, the Arab dimension is very important for two reasons, I think, the region, because as Jeff pointed out, and as I explained earlier, you know, authoritarian regimes and colonial regimes collide in wanting to keep power. And this is becoming obvious in ways that 20 or 30 years ago was not obvious. So what you're starting is that you're heading towards a situation in which people are on the grassroots are becoming much more critical of authoritarian and unjust regimes. We saw that in the Arab uprisings, you see that in, in Israel, you see this now with the work on again, for the one state solution. But you also see the problem of how do you translate this popular opposition against some very authoritarian and repressive regimes. And that's not gonna, it's not easy. This is, you know, I believe the Arab uprising is a first phase of a revolution that is not, has not ended and it will impact the rest of the region. My concern really is more about how will international community and help the region go towards a democratic uh, situation. It doesn't look good for the Arabs in the short term. The repression in Egypt is worse. The Syrian civil war is not yet over. Situation in Iraq is catastrophic. You know, how, so long as these problems are going on, Israel, Palestine, Israel can do the hell it wants. But what is important while we're waiting is that we do work. And the important work is precisely emphasizing the issue of justice and equality. And in that respect, I see the importance of holding Israel accountable as well as empowering and supporting the Palestinians in the struggle for justice and uh, you know, liberation. So, and that struggle is very much connected with the Arab struggles. So you cannot be supporting Saudi Arabia or yeah. Arab Emirates just because they're making peace with Israel because they have an interest in making peace in Israel and have done them peace for very long, you know? So you cannot, and that, that brings the economic question again, you know, so long as you have big business making money from this, you're not going anywhere. Yeah, we, we can talk as much as we want, but if you don't get the business to understand that it's not in its interest in the long term, as just as happening now, people are trying in the United States, pushing the business community away from Trump and seeing the danger in supporting Trump, you know, you're gonna have Trump again, so. Thank you for that. I'm aware of the time and I've just got a couple of, uh, qu couple of questions to end with. Um, this one comes from one of your former students, uh, Leila Karim Arishi, uh, mm -hmm. who uh, says Hi, that you, you were her, uh, his, you were his uh, uh, favorite professor. Uh, and it has to do with something that, that all of us are thinking about. What, what can we do here? What can we do in the U.S. to support a one-state solution? We're a bunch of activists on this screen here. Give us your marching orders, both of you. Layla, <laughs> Layla first and then Jeff. And then I've got one closing question for you both. For me, I think the best way we can support the Palestinian in the United States is support the BDS movement. I think the BDS movement, if the United States can support the BDS movement as activists, to say that you know there should be a boycott of Israel divestment and sanctions so long as it does not uphold international law, I think that can go very far, very, very far. And with this new administration? The new administration is, you know. Yeah, I know. But there's not much to be done. They want to calm the situation. They're busy with China. It's much more important. They don't want, they don't like Netanyahu, but whoever comes after Netanyahu, if anybody replaces Netanyahu, it's not gonna be 
any difference. I think that the, 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 the administration is intelligent in understanding that Iran has to be brought up into the picture because Iran is the only counterweight to Israel in the region. And I think that's important, even though Iran is not a democratic regime, but Iran is a, is a substantial state. So bringing it in and having, having it be less under sanction will create a balance of power in a different way. And this doesn't mean that it, it's gonna push for democracy, but what it means is that you, you do need a counterweight for Israel, but above all, you need to both help the Arabs in their struggle for economic justice and equality, any viable state. So empower the Arabs anywhere they are, condemn the civil war in Syria, condemn the regime and do something about it. Just as condemn Israel and impose the sanctions, I think the sanction will go very far. Just like in South Africa, South Africa was a very powerful country, a very powerful economy. The sanction had a big impact in South Africa. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> well, I just go back to what I, was, uh, what I said before. And that is that uh, you should keep doing what you're doing. EDS is important, the different campaigns. There's a lot of, uh, of uh, you know, groups working for Palestinian rights from the, you know, from you guys in Indiana, the Jewish Voice for Peace and the US campaign and Students for Justice in Palestine and, um, you know, all kinds of church groups and, uh, and other groups and all over the world. I mean, I think, you know, when I say that uh, we have to mobilize the international civil society, the good news is that it's already mobilized. In other words, we've got uh, decades of work on Palestine. You have all over the world uh, uh, Palestinian groups. I mean, I've been in China. I've been in, in Korea. I've been in the Faroe Islands talking to Palestine, Palestinian uh, support groups. That's there. What's missing is the end game. And that's the problem because you can't have BDS. BDS is a tool. It isn't a standalone thing. Right. Unless BDS is attached to an end game, what are we BDSing for? It, it, it becomes a standalone thing that doesn't have much point. Um, a lot of the campaigns um, uh, you know, that exist lobbying with uh, members of parliament or, you know, which they do in the UK a lot, for example. I mean, those are important, but you can't really lobby with members of parliament or members of Congress unless you've got something to sell. And uh, so we've got to have an end game. That's where our group, and hopefully it'll grow and, and, and so on, uh, can make a tremendous, con make the contribution. The contribution is to insert a political end game around which then, all of you and all your groups can mobilize in an effective way. Without that, we're floundering. Without an I, end I think, game, yeah, without I think Jeff, game. you're right. That the end game is very important, but BDS is still effective, even if for many people they don't like the end game, but it can still be effective as it will say, like just hold Israel accountable. You know, don't yeah, but, BDS, but BDS isn't going any, isn't leading you anywhere. No, BDS, it's a tool. It's a tool. BDS is not BDS a political is, program. It's not yeah. a it's keeping Palestine on the map which is good, but it's not a political program. And in fact, I'll go further, but I don't want to open a whole new discussion and say that the three elements of BDS are outdated. You know, they were set 20 years ago. Two of the three reflect a two-state approach. One of them is end the occupation. Mm -hmm. so trying to, we're trying to get away from the, uh, from the occupation-centered approach to a wider colonial approach, settler colonial approach, Another one is equal rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel. So here you've got that dichotomy again, the, you know, Israel here, the occupation there. So I think it's, I think BDS is problematic. It has to be rethought and, and definitely it has to be connected to an end game. Otherwise it's good to do. Everything's good to do. I disagree with you. I think it's, it's, it's a tool. I agree with you. You need an end game, but it's very difficult to have an end game when, people are very scared to give up what they have right now, but the tool of PDS, given that it is based on international law, can go very far. If Israel can adhere to any of these three things, yeah. you would go because you would not have had the nationality law, you would allow the right of return, and you would have Israel, uh, you would not have expanded settlements, you know? So, I mean, I think you're right that the end goal is very important. I think, yeah, campaigning for the one state is definitely very important, but in the immediate, in the immediate term, 
any policy that can point out and sanction Israel for its violation of the Palestine, of Palestinian rights can be affected, but not not in a, in a vacuum, of course. Thank, <laughs> thanks to both of you. I'm I'm gonna ask them one last question, but before I do. We'll be hosting a screening of There is a Field, a film exploring the intersection of Black and Palestinian lives. We'll make the avail film available for a week for those who want to watch it in advance and host a joint screening on Friday, March 19th at 1230, followed by a conversation with filmmaker Jen Marlowe and one of the actors. We hope you'll share the news of our interviews and this film screening with your friends. I'd also like to remind you that uh, Layla is co-editor of the recently published Arab and Jewish Questions, Geographies of Engagement in Palestine and Beyond. And Jeff is the author of the also recently published Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Zionism Settler Colonialism, and the Case for One Democratic State. So here's my last question for each one of you. And Leila, I'm going to go to you first. In an interview uh, a few years back with Alice Rothschild, I, I, I'm asking you now to speak personally. Uh, you said very movingly in this interview, you said to me, and, and, and really it, it caught me, it, it, it made me catch my breath how moving this was, Leila. So you said to me, Palestine means exile as much as home. It means hope as much as a prison. And it means resilience and determination. It means olive trees. It means those beautiful undulated hills. It means resilience and modesty and determination, rights and justice. It means right. Mm -hmm. say, say a word about what your stake is in, in, in all this. <laughs> a very, a very I don't remember question. having said that, but thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I think it captures it. Yeah, Palestine. Palestine is the roots. Palestine is, is, a, is a place which evokes lots of hope. And at the in the essence of Palestine is the issue of rights. Now, why am I committed to it? It's because my history is a Palestinian history, a Palestinian diaspora history at one point, but also one that has roots in Palestine. My family is in Palestine. My parents died in Palestine. I still go regularly there. My work of my life has been on Israel and Palestine. So I, I do, I mean, I, I also grew in my understanding of Palestine as a result of what we live. So I do genuinely believe that this land can take everybody. And the problem, you know, Palestine has always known lots of people, has always had lots of people passing by it, staying in it, resting in it. Okay. It is the last on the major unknown, uh, unresolved colonial conflict. And I think in that respect, it can also be, as Jeff said, emblematic of how we can live together in the 21st century. So this is why it's so important to remember how, what does right mean? What do right means and how can we protect them in the 21st century? And this cuts at the intersection of, as you said, rights, equality, race, culture, um, history. Uh, but the fundamental issue remains equality and right to freedom. It's been a delight to get to know you, Leila, in this uh, short uh, short space. Uh, and I would encourage people to Google Leila uh, Farsak and Alice Rothschild. And there's a, a wonderful uh, interview online that you can read. And uh, I'll try to make that available too. Jeff, uh, uh, it's your shot. In your latest book, you identify yourself uh, up front as, quote, the colonist who refuses, the comrade in the joint struggle. You want to talk a little bit about your personal stake in all this? Well, I get into all kinds of new issues in the last minute of the <laughs> of the discussion. Uh, no, it's simply that um, you know I live here and I came here, so there's a, a subtext. You know, I uh, I came to live here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I do believe there's a place here for the Jewish people. I don't think this isn't a colonial situation in the sense that, uh, you know, a British farmer gets up one morning and goes to Kenya to get cheap land and cheap labor to get rich. 
I think there is a genuine tie between the Jewish people in this country. Um, so that, if, I don't know if that's considered Zionism necessarily, but I, I think there is that tie. At the same time, of course, we've got to accept the fact that the Zionist movement uh, was a settler colonial movement. In other words, the problem for, wasn't that Jews wanted to live here. Jews have come here for hundreds of years. Palestinians have always accepted Jews. And, as a, and Jews were a part of the indigenous Palestinian community, certainly Sephardi Jews and many Mizrahi Jews, and even ultra-Orthodox Jews that came in the 17th and 18th centuries, and many of them spoke Arabic. And what, so, about, what about Jeff the Jew? Wait, okay, but that wasn't the problem. <laughs> that wasn't the problem, the Jews coming here. The problem was that Zionism said not only that we're coming here, but this land belongs to us exclusively. Like all settler colonial movements, it, it, it invented a story of why the, they're the natives, why it belongs to them and why the Palestinians have to, be, uh, have to be displaced and eliminated. That's the part that I couldn't accept ever. Yeah. So that, so that uh, you know, in, in the United States, uh, you know, I think identity politics were a part of the 60s that I grew up in. So I got very involved with uh, my Jewish identity but I'm not religious in any way. And in Minnesota, where I come from, the Jewish community is pretty thin. So I, so I think in a sense, there was an identity shift and I became Israeli in the sense that my Jewish identity in a kind of a national way, without the ideology, without the nationalism, without the Zionism, uh, uh, changed, my, changed my identity, there's an identity shift that led me here. Uh, so, that, so that I think I'm, trying to be a colonist or a settler who refuses and others who say I want to be in this country and I think you know I you know I do have ties to this country that are that are historical and whatever but I can't be a part of this country as a settler as a colonist uh, as someone who's not only disconnected from the indigenous population but who oppresses them so I've got to find a way to reconcile that and that's what I that was the that joint title I took in the introduction to my book, on the one hand, I'm a colonist who refuses, but the fact that I accept the fact, recognize that I'm a colonist, makes me responsible for my actions and the actions of my people. And that goes into this whole political initiative. But at the same time, I want to also be a comrade, you know, uh, because in the end, we all have to live together in this country. And, uh, and, uh, so hopefully I'll earn my, I'll never be indigenous like the Palestinians, but I'll earn what I call sufficient indigeity. Indigenate. <laughs> you don't need the indigeneity. What okay. matters is what you, you know, just said. Is that wanting to live with everybody there. That's what matters. Yeah. That's 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 part of the society. Right. So that's the long story short. Yeah, Jeff, uh, thank you so much. Leila, thank you uh, very much, both of you. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. We'll continue this conversation again soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you for everybody who's participating as well. Here.